Dear participants, uh, my name is Dr. Julia Zions, and I have a great pleasure to welcome you at the sixth EuroBloodNet's topic on Focus Cutaneous Lymphoma webinar. Uh, before we start, um, I would like to ask you to mute your microphones and switch off your cameras to maintain better streaming quality. And uh, of course, please make sure you have entered your full name and surname in WebEx. Um, as I already mentioned, it's important for receiving the educational points after attending the whole cycle of uh, webinars. And if you have um, any questions um, uh, to the presentation, please write it uh, in the chat. Um, and uh, the chat you can find under the cloud uh, symbol where you can also find the test message I'm sending to you uh, now. And dear audience, uh, please welcome uh, with me today um, two speakers, Professor Emanuela Guenova and Professor Pablo Ortiz Romero, who will tell us about primary cutaneous follicle center lymphoma and primary cutaneous marginal zone lymphoma. Uh, professor Dr. Emanuela Guenova is professor of dermatology at the Faculty of Biology and Medicine um, at the University of Lausanne and a senior physician scientist leading the specialized cutaneous lymphoma clinic at the Department of Dermatology of the Lausanne University Hospital. She obtained her medical degree at the University of Tübingen and continued her postgraduate training there. Subsequently, she worked as a cutaneous lymphoma fellow at the Harvard Medical School in Boston. Professor Guenova has been leading the cutaneous lymphoma program and the research group with focus on skin immunology and cutaneous lymphoma at the Department of Dermatology of the University Hospital Zurich. Professor Pablo Ortiz Romero is dermatologist specialized in cutaneous lymphoma. Professor Ortiz is head of the dermatology department at the University Hospital in Madrid, Spain. He's also professor of dermatology at the Universitat Complutense, Complutense sorry, in Madrid, where he got qualified as a doctor of medicine and where he obtained his PhD degree. PR to his current position, Professor Ortiz Romero was head of the melanoma and cutaneous lymphoma unit at the hospital university of the 12th of October for 14 years. Professor Guenova, Professor Ortiz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Julia, for your kind presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank your blood net for the possibility for uh, participation in this series of webinars. Okay, we, uh, Professor Guenova and me, we don't have any uh, conflict of interest. Uh, for the, the talk of today, we will speak about primary cutaneous marginal cell lymphoma, primary cutaneous follicle center lymphoma, and finally, some words about lymphoma mimickers. Uh, primary cutaneous lymphoma are a group of lymphoid neoplasia that uh, present initially in the skin. It's very important to, to, uh, to know uh, at the time of diagnosis that there is no any extracutaneous involvement in this moment, because in this case, the most frequent is that this is a systemic lymphoma that could go, could have involved secondarily the skin. Um, epidemiologically, they are rare diseases. The incidence is, uh, is around 10 cases per million inhabitants uh, every year. Um, so it's a rare diseases. Most cases are T-cell lymphoma. Around 80% of, of them are lymphomas originated in T-cells and around 20% of them are B-cell lymphomas. Uh, it's very important to, have, to bear in mind that, that uh, we find in the classification of lymphoma some uh, entities with the same name and the same morphology as cutaneous lymphoma, uh, exactly the same. But we have to know that they are different diseases with different prognosis and should be treated differently. So the classification in, uh, of uh, primary cutaneous lymphomas has been, recent, has been recently updated in the, um, by the WHO ERTC classification. 
and appears in this uh, paper in blood uh, that appears uh, early in 2019 and also appears in the blue book of the WHO. But I have to say that this is not exactly the same classif classification because uh, usually dermatologists, we consider that marital and stone lymphoma is a distinct entity and however in the blue book is included in the rest of mild, mild lymphoma. So uh, this is not exactly the same. For the talk of today, we'll, we will mention only the two first um, entities that, that appear on the slide because they are uh, very indolent. The five-year survival is excellent with 99 and 95% of survival. So um, I'm happy to share a few words on the primary cutaneous marginal zone lymphoma with you. The primary cutaneous marginal zone B-cell lymphoma is a recently acknowledged skin lymphoma entity and is defined as the other lymphomas by the lack of cutaneous involvement at the time of diagnosis and lack of fulfillment of criteria for any other small B-cell lymphoma. Its first description dates actually only to the early, early 80s, 1984, and currently Previously coined terms such as lymphoplasmocytoid, lymphoma, immunocytoma, non-myelomatous plasmocytoma of the skin, and uh, similar, are replaced by the EURFTC WHO officially recognized entity primary cutaneous marginal zone lymphoma. The marginal zone lymphoma of the skin is more common than the rare uh, primary cutaneous diffuse large B-cell lymphoma leg type but is less common than the primary cutaneous follicle center lymphoma that Professor Ortiz will present afterwards. This lymphoma has a male uh, preponderance and affects predominantly individuals in their 50s and 60s. However, there have been cases reported in children, and there has been occasionally um, publications from a series of patients that were in their 30s or even younger. The prognosis of the disease is uh, an excellent one. The primary cutaneous marginal zone lymphoma can present clinically with subtle erythematous or violaceous macules, plaques, papules, most commonly nodules. The location is most commonly on the arms and the upper tract. Around 30% of the lesions are located in the head and neck region, and legs are only suddenly affected. The distribution pattern can vary from solitary or multifocal to sometimes uh, a very wildly distributed disease. The more rare agmenated or anatodermic form have a very characteristic clinical appearance, but they represent a real diagnostic pitfall because of their rareness and somewhat unusual clinical appearance. On conventional histology, the primary cutaneous marginal zone lymphoma is characterized by often top-heavy, patchy, nodular, or diffuse lymphoid infiltrates with reactive germinal centers, something that resembles very much a normal lymph node structure. So reactive lymphocytes are very common, and plasma cells predominate. Immunohistochemistry reveals a mixed population composed of many reactive T and B lymphocytes and marginal zone cells that are CD20 positive, CD79 positive, and BCO2 positive. In the same time, they are negative for CD5, CD10, and BCL6. Characteristic is the presence of a variable number of plasmacytoid cells, and especially the monoclonal expression of either the kappa or the lambda, here you see lambda, light chain of the B-cell receptor. Monoclonal expression of either kappa or lambda, the so-called light chain restriction, is so important immunohistochemical feature that from a practical perspective, a diagnosis of cutaneous marginal zone B-cell lymphoma should be questioned if this feature is not present in your specimen. B-cell 6 and to a lesser extent, CD10 antibodies are particularly useful to differentiate this lymphoma from the other common cutaneous B-cell lymphoma, namely the cutaneous follicle center lymphoma. But keep in mind 
that uh, follicular B lymphocytes in the reactive part of the marginal tonal lymphoma will be BCL6 positive. So you really have to pay attention in the diagnosing maybe a tricky one for a less experienced um, dermatopathologist. Extra nodal, the marginal tonal lymphomas arising in various uh, mild mucosis associated lymphoid tissue organs including the skin, so all of the WHO and WHO UITC category, but none of the other slow-grade B-cell lymphomas express this IRTA. This is for IgG receptor translocation associated one, and this is um, a molecule recognizing the equivalent to the marginal tone in human lymphoid tissues other than the spleen, so it can be a useful um, histological marker and criteria. To the subtypes, I would just say a few words. IgM expression can be observed in a very small subset here of primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma. And usually those are the ones that are called non-class switched. In, in their majority, the marginal tone primary cutaneous B cell lymphoma express IgG, IgA, or IgE, that means they're class switched and lose the expression of CXCR3 and lose expression for IgM. So this is the general case. The small group of non-class switched lymphomas um, tend to have more frequently extracutaneous dissemination. That's why it is important to check for these molecules. Last but not least, immunohistochemistry and especially um, uh, in situ hybridization for the kappa and lambda light chains is the most sensitive way currently um, accepted to approve clonality for marginal tone B-cell lymphoma of the skin. However, you can also apply molecular pathology and data for the monoclonal rearrangement of the B-cell receptor heavy chain um, prove around 50 to 60% positivity of the cases. Genetics of primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma is still an uncharted water. Although somatic mutations have been reported in more than 70% of the cases, they are different, diverse. There is still a lack of high consistency and a consistent unique diagnostic feature and molecular studies are currently not mandatory for the diagnostic workup. Um, translocations are a big subject more in the nodal and non-cutaneous lymphomas. So, for example, the T1118 translocation is very commonly detected in gastric and lung cell tumors, but it's very, very seldomly at T0 to 5% detected in marginal uh, tone lymphoma of the skin. The same is true also for other translocations commonly detected in marginal lymphomas other than the cutaneous one, and um, often, but without uh, clinical relevance in around 24% of the cases, you can have the T14-18 um, translocation um, that uh, brings the IgG heavy chain and the mouth one together, both in the marginal lymphoma of the skin, but also other marginal lymphomas. Cases showing trisomy 3 may be characterized by upregulation of FOXP1. Those are rare cases of uh, marginal tone lymphoma of the skin. And trisomy 18, this one uh, related to BCL2 expression, is common in intestinal, salivary gland, ocular adnexal tumors, but is very rare in cutaneous cases. So to summarize this slide, usually we perform the translocations um, mostly with the idea to seek secondary skin manifestation of a lymphoma other than primary cutaneous, then to confirm the diagnosis of primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma. What do we need for the diagnostic workup and staging in primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma? 
Of course, we need a complete clinical examination, skin biopsy, and imaging. Currently, um, PT or wherever possible, PET-CT is recommended. And the laboratory study should include complete differential blood count, blood chemistry, including LDH, which is um, considered, and there is some evidence that it might be a um, diagnostic parameter and important for the assessment of the prognosis, although it is still debatable. Aurelian Bogdorferi serology and serum electrophoresis. Now, even though the literature around the role of Aurelia Bogdorferi in primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma is not very conclusive, PCR examination is still positioned in the routine workup, and uh, this association should be further investigated. Regarding therapy, unfortunately, um, we still lack um, um, randomized controlled clinical trials. And that's why the treatment recommendations for primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma are based on small, often retrospective studies. So consensus recommendations have been published by the URTC and by International Society for Cutaneous Lymphoma and also by the European Society of Medical Oncology. In most cases, the best practice require a multidisciplinary expert evaluation. Indirect therapies are efficient. Many patients, depending on the distribution and the clinical manifestation of the lesions, can be managed with the so-called watchful waiting strategy. Solitary lesions may be excised or treated very efficiently by radiotherapy. Clinical response can be achieved also an excellent clinical response with the intralesional application of corticosteroids, the CD20 antibody rituximab, or interferon alpha. For patients with multiple lesions, the same treatments, rituximab and interferon alpha, can be applied systemically, intravenously, or subcutaneously. And the antibiotic therapy has, although not unequivocal, still its role in the treatment of primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma. In an experimental setting, modified, so far most interferon alpha producing viruses, salt like receptor agonists, or several case reports on photodynamic therapy have been reported to have a seemingly good efficacy in marginal tone lymphoma and could be a good next generation treatment strategy for this disease. So I think the antibiotics um, we can discuss afterwards in the, in the question session um, necessitates um, a few words from my side because this subject is really highly debatable. In Borrelia bogdorferi, clearly associated primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma or lymphocytoma, antibiotic therapy should be attempted before more aggressive or another therapy is started. However, the literature regarding the efficacy um, is really very weak, and there has, has been one case report um, and a series of reviewing 14 patients treated with antibiotics, mostly doxycycline or tetracycline, and the response rate was 43% uh, complete remission. Okay, uh, primary cutaneous uh, follicular cell lymphoma accounts for around 12% of all cutaneous lymphoma. This is uh, based in international uh, papers. I have to say that in Spain, uh, marginal cell lymphoma is a little bit more frequent and follicular center lymphoma as uh, appears in the uh, Spanish registry we are, uh, we are doing. Uh, it's a little bit more frequent, but internationally it's more frequent follicular than marginal zone. Uh, it's a little bit more frequent in, in males than females, and usually they appear in middle-aged people. Um, the first pillar of the um, study of lymphoma is clinical presentation. As um, Professor Genova mentioned uh, it's very important to have a, a full skin examination. 
And uh, patients can present with a different kind of lesion, plaques, papules, nodules, occasionally okay, really big tumors. And it's very frequent to look around those lesions because not rarely you can find small papules, occasionally okay, tiny papules surrounding the, the, uh, the, the big uh, central lesions. Usually it's frequently they are single lesion or if they are multiple, they are frequently grow up in, a, in an area. The color is usually red, but also violaceous. It's uh, very typical from visceral lymphoma, the violaceous color. And usually those, those lesions are non ulcerated The location is more frequently on the head and on the back and than or, uh, other uh, areas. The extracutaneous dissemination is rare. Only 5 to 10% of uh, cases go to lymph nodes. And uh, prognosis is excellent with uh, five-year survival, around 95%. The lesions can be uh, quite different. For example, the, the lesion on the left is a forehead of patient that finally passed away because of uh, follicular center lymphoma primary cutaneous. It looks like a patch, but it uh, was a very, very thin plaque. Can start like that, or can be uh, multiple nodules, like on the right picture, or can be uh, on the uh, on the ear lobe or on the scalp. Uh, most of those lesions, as I, as I mentioned, are, are um, violaceous color and are non-ulcerated. I usually keep to my residents uh, and I, and I tell, uh, tell them, if you have to bed uh, for, a, for a set of beer with a friend, if, the, if you think about the lymphoma and, it's, and, and this is a, a violaceous color, go for a B-cell lymphoma. And if this is non-ulcerated, go for a B-cell lymphoma. But this is red or Ulcerated is uh, better bed the beers into a, a T cell lymphoma. You can lose the beer, but the most frequent is that you win if you go for that. Next, please. Sorry. <laughs> can be plaques also on the on the scalp, like uh, this case, or uh, can be um, like this. You, you can see on the left. This is a follicular center lymphoma. This is red. This is this is not blue. You will uh, you will you can fail if you think in uh, B-cell lymphoma with that, in T-cell lymphoma with that, because it, it's B, the usual is like, like the delicious um, color as in the right picture. Uh, multiple lesions, also red in this uh, young lady. And uh, usually they are not ulcerated, but can be ulcerated. So this is a, a general rule, this is not mandatory. There is an uh, old entity which is uh, known as reticulohistocytoma of, of the dorsum or, or crusted lymphoma that was a um, um, lesion with usually a big site that were excised in uh, months or even years later, new lesion appeared and was excised again. And uh, now we know that this is a primary cutaneous follicular center lymphoma. And um, it, it's, it's important to look around the, the, the big lesion to look for a small papule, occasionally even tiny. You can check and you can think that this is a folliculitis or something like that. And you have to uh, try to excise all of them or destroy it with whatever you want because it's not rare that this is also lymphoma. And uh, you don't uh, check because it's a small lesion. And some years later, this is lesion that now has one millimeter can have two, three centimeters uh, in one, two years. The second pillar of uh, the study of uh, cutaneous lymphoma is histopathology. And uh, follicular center lymphoma, primary cutaneous can be follicular, diffuse, or mixed. Follicular uh, presentation is more frequent on the scalp and early lesions. Uh, usually, B cells don't like epidermis. So there's uh, frequently a green zone between a normal epidermis and the rest of infiltrate, a band, uh, which is called a green zone. And uh, the infiltration, the infiltrate is usually a mix of centrocyte and centroblast. It's very frequent that uh, the infiltrate is much more intense in the in, in go, well, go back please in the in the deeper area of the of the infiltrate that you can see on the on the left and if you go deeper into the into the uh, into the slide you can find that there is always a mix of different kind of cells centrocyte and central light and centroblast in different uh, uh, proportion different percentage 
because if you find a um, monomorphic infiltrate like this one you can find the, uh, in the screen, you should uh, consider first a leg type lymphoma, a visceral leg type lymphoma, which is a much more aggressive uh, disease. The third pillar of a uh, study of the of cutaneous lymphoma is immunohistochemistry. This is, of course, a visceral lymphoma with positivity to CD19, CD20, CD79 alpha. CD5 is usually negative. And uh, the typical of this um, uh, follicular lymphoma is BCL6 positive with BCL2 negative. CD10 is usually positive in uh, case of follicular presentation, but is usually negative in case of diffuse. And MOM1 is negative because this is, this is typical from leg type. On the upper row, you can see in the left BCL6 positive in the terminal center. BCL2 is negative in, in the middle, but uh, you can find uh, some positive cells, probably T cells, because they are positive. T cells are positive for BCL2. Uh, and the proliferation is not very high usually and is inside the the germinal centers. In, the, in the, um, the low part of the presentation of the slide, BCLT6 positive, BCL2 uh, negative, and CD10 positive. Uh, and there is usually a disbalance between kappa and lambda. Usually it is not so intense as this one, but if you find it, uh, as uh, Professor Genova uh, mentioned, you can almost con uh, uh, be sure that this is a um, uh, um, um, clonal pr uh, uh, preparation of this. And this is not exactly clonality. This is uh, 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 this is what we assume that this is clonal, because clonality for clonality you, we should perform um, uh, uh, the study of, uh, of uh, heavy chain gene rearrangement. It's a monoclonal, as you can see here in this uh, image. Um, there are also some cytogenetic ab abnormalities that have been published in this lymphoma. Between 60 and 80% of cases have amplification of, dif of different genes, for some CRL, BCL11, or CDK4. There have been also published some somatic mutation between 40 and 60% of cases, several of them in the TNF pathway or some oncogenes like CMIC or uh, PAX5 or BCL6. Translocation are uh, not very frequent. 5% show translocation of uh, T314 with uh, activates that activate BCL6. And between 0 and 40% of cases, uh, translocation for 1418 with activation of BCL2 have been published. And uh, deletion have been also found between 60 and 70% of cases with deletion of the heavy chain gene and rarely uh, deletion of P16. And what should be the, the diagnostic workup for, for this lymphoma? We should order blood cell count with differential, blood chemistry, including LDH, serum electrophoresis, uh, flow cytometry to, and BCR rearrangement in peripheral blood to know if there is any uh, peripheral, peripheral blood involvement of monoclonal cell or atypical cells. A CT scan or PET CT, depending on uh, what you have in your center or what is uh, produces less irradiation. And it's very important for this lymphoma to order bone marrow biopsy because it is known that around 11% of primary cutaneous uh, follicular center lymphoma are positive in, in bone marrow. And occasionally, the, this is the only at, uh, uh, involvement outside the skin. So it's very important to go to order this in this lymphoma. About treatment, first line uh, therapy depends on uh, how are the lesions. If you have a single lesion and you can excise, uh, we go for that. It's the, the best option, excise, excise it. And uh, occasionally in, the, in, the, in, in, the, in our hospital, the first day of the, of the uh, uh, consultation, we excise the lesion and occasionally the patient is cured. It's a, uh, if the lesion is a little bit bigger, we go, we order radiotherapy, local radiotherapy, usually with electrons. Uh, in as alternative, we can use in, uh, interlesion interferon or interlesion rituximab. If the lesions are multifocal, uh, it's acceptable to wait, at, wait and see if the lesions are not progressing very fast. Uh, if you can convince your radiotherapist to go for radiotherapy for multiple lesions, 
um, it could be an excellent choice for somebody in our hospital. They usually accept uh, radiotherapy with a maximum of, of six lesions. Uh, and if not, we can uh, use mono, uh, rituximab intravenous as monotherapy or as an alternative uh, rituximab plus multi-agent uh, chemotherapy. Uh, in case of leg lesion, the recommendation is to go for uh, the same treatment as the, um, the leg type cutaneous lymphoma with uh, rituximab plus CHOP. And uh, in case of cutaneous relapse, it's important to, to know that we go, could go to, uh, with the same approach as first-line ter therapy because this is not uh, meaning that this is uh, an aggressive relapse. And we could go with the same treatment as before. The response are usually very good. For example, in radiotherapy or excision, the complete response are between 98 and 99%. And uh, the, something similar happens with uh, rituximab that both interlational or intravenous, the response are pretty good. And what about the prognosis? The prognosis is uh, this is an indolent lymphoma. The prognosis is excellent with five years survival, around 95%. Relapses in the skin uh, appear uh, more or less in one third of the patients, and extracutaneous uh, lymph node uh, spread appears in five to ten percent of cases. And, so, and now some questions: uh, do, do multiple lesions worsen prognosis? No, it's the same uh, prognosis as single lesion. What about high percentage of blood cells? Again, there is no difference in the in the prognosis. What happens if you find the translocation 1418? Uh, usually, no, no um, worsen prognosis, but uh, because the, the this translocation can appear in a primary cutaneous uh, follicular center lymphoma, but if you find this translocation in a supposedly cutaneous lymphoma, you have first to look very intensely the, the uh, workup with CT scan, PET CT, or, or whatever. And even if you don't find no nothing, you can you have to follow the patient. But we all have patients that have this uh, translocation, and uh, one, two, five years later, uh, lymph node um, uh, enlarged, and this uh, uh, were in are infiltrated by the lymphoma. And we consider that this is, this is a systemic lymphoma from the beginning. Uh, about BCL2 expression is the exactly the same as uh, translocation 1418. Usually this, um, this uh, 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 primary uh, cutaneous follicular center lymphoma are BCL2 negative, uh, BCL6 positive. Uh, and if you find a double positivity, BCL2 and BCL6, you have to uh, consider the possibility that this is a systemic lymphoma. And if you don't find it, you have to look for look for it, uh, follow the, the patient um, uh, for a long time, but can be primary. So this is not uh, that does not mean that this is a systemic. And the final question: What happened in, in case of involvement of legs? Uh, in this case, uh, yes, possibly there is uh, some uh, series that uh, this is uh, this means a worse prognosis. And this is why, in case of involvement of legs, the the treatment recommendation is with rituximab plus uh, multi-agent chemotherapy. But this, in this case, maybe. And now again, uh, Professor Genova. Thank you. <laughs> just a few words, really very few words, um, just to point out that uh, besides the two very common primary cutaneous B-cell lymphoma, there are some mimickers. mimickers. Of course, there are multiple cutaneous disorders that can simulate cutaneous B-cell lymphomas, either clinically or histopathologically or clinically and histopathologically. So those can be benign conditions, can be other uh, tumors from T or B-cell origin in the skin, or some non-lymphoid malignant tumors or benign um, proliferation. So the most commonly used name for those mimickers, we may consider the pseudo lymphoma. I'm sorry for the typo, which will be corrected. In this context, it is important um, to underline 
um, that the term pseudolymphoma is not a diagnosis per se, actually, and it should, should not be used to classify a given disease as it encompasses skin conditions with very different etiology, pathogenesis, clinical pathologic presentation or behavior. It may be also very early uh, stage or uncertainty for the diagnosis of uh, primary cutaneous marginal or follicle lymphoma. So repetitive biopsies may also change um, the category we're putting um, the B-cell pseudolymphoma over time. So lymphocytoma cutis um, is a generic term as well, uh, which is used uh, as a category to put together all cutaneous pseudolymphomas of different, uh, um, of different etiology that histologically, histologically mimic very strongly the primary marginal tone lymphoma because they have germinal uh, centers histologically. So most of the cases reported in this category are related indeed to infection with different species for Borrelia burgdorferi, but various other antigenic stimuli can induce lymphocytoma cutis, and this can be insect bites, drugs, vaccinations, acupuncture, tattoos, wearing of uh, piercing, medicinal leech therapy, and, uh, and many, many others. One peculiar um, and interesting histological and clinical mimicker is the cutaneous IgG4-related disease. For the sake of time, this slide is just intended to raise your awareness and make you think of those differential diagnoses without going too briefly. I will just mention that the IgG4-related disease is characterized by multiple nodular lesions clinically and um, lymphocytic infiltration in the skin with the predominance of uh, IgG4 positive uh, plasma cells and also um, detection of IgG4 elevated levels uh, in the serum of the patient. A uh, histological uh, clue for the diagnosis is the fibrotic um, development, fibrosis in the tissue. From the other diseases on the list, lupus erythematosus, mostly uh, lupus tumidus, is a clinical mimicker of B cell uh, lymphomas of the skin. Histology here very quickly solves the problem because it's a T cell dominated disease and clusters of CD123 plasma cytoid dendritic cells can be often found in the lesions. Then uh, those entities here, cutaneous extramedullary hematopoiesis, histiocytoid Swiss syndrome, cutaneous manifestation of Kasselmann disease, and angiolymphoid hyperplasia and eosinophilia in some cases can clinically mimic the cell lymphomas. And again, experienced dermatopathologists will very quickly solve the conundrum here by performing um, their respective immunohistochemistry analysis. The Rosé Dorfman disease, in my experience, is a very characteristic uh, clinically, but somehow patients with this disease are always uh, referred to, to cutaneous B cell lymphoma uh, specialists because clinically, obviously, um, they mimic it. And here I would like to uh, present you one case in case uh, you have not uh, seen a Rosé Dorfman disease yet because it is quite a rare dermatological entity. Another name for this disease is sinus histiocytosis with massive lymphadenopathy. And uh, histologically, you can quickly, if you observe precisely and well, and if you pay attention and know about the existence of this diagnosis, you can very quickly make the diagnosis because um, even before immunohistochemistry, where you will find formi histiocytes with this peculiar phenotype CD68 positive, CD100 positive, but CD1A negative, if you look for enteripolasis, and here is an example, a very nice example of this, you should immediately think on Rosé Dorfman disease. And enteripolasis is just the presence of intact cells within the cytoplasm of another cell. So engulfment here, you see it very nicely. And um, as a last uh, case before the discussion, I would like uh, to present you this 56-year-old uh, uh, lady. The case uh, is an observation 
from the theme of Professor Helmut Carroll, and I always find it impressive and I like to share it. Um, this patient uh, developed uh, without any previous medical history those violations disseminated nodules on her lower legs and on histology. Of course, you, you see uh, in the mid-dermis uh, this uh, germinal center-like uh, structures um, with um, pronounced lymphocytic infiltrate if you stain for CD20, CD70. Uh, 9, BCL2, BCL6, you will find uh, um, histological similarities and you may be tempted to name the disease a marginal zone lymphoma after skin or lymphocytoma. Uh, but if you deepen the anamnesis, uh, then you will discover that the lady has uh, been treating uh, her venous uh, insufficiency with this medicinal leeches. And at every point where the medicinal leeches were biting, she developed those lymphocytoma or pseudolymphoma, whichever diagnosis you prefer most of the skin. To summarize, primary cutaneous marginal zone and follicle center lymphoma are the two most common primary cutaneous B-cell lymphomas. They have a good prognosis. And various skin disorders can simulate primary cutaneous B-cell lymphomas. So when you have a bump on the skin, just make a bi biopsy and have a look what is inside. Sometimes you will be surprised. With that, um, I would like to thank you for um, your attention. Thank you for uh, the European Reference Network for giving us the opportunity to participate in this educational series. And I would like to, to pass the word to, to Julia to leave the discussion or to unmute you for the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gwenova and Professor um, Ortiz, for this uh, very interesting uh, session. And indeed, uh, now I would like to invite uh, the audience to ask questions and uh, please write them in the chat. We have a we have a question from Argentina. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Paula Enz uh, mentioned that uh, they usually do not perform blood flow cytometry in follicular center lymphoma, and uh, she wants to know why it's necessary. I, I have to say that we usually perform, uh, but uh, until now I, we have no find any single case in which uh, there is a, a, a positive, um, uh, we found an aberrant uh, population circulating in peripheral blood, but uh, it's included in the, in the recommendation of the URTC. Um, I think it's most, mostly to um, be sure that you don't lose something that looks like something cutaneous and uh, in fact is something systemic. So let me see. There is a question from Julia to me. Do I think that the primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma may be also termed a lymphoproliferative disease? Um, yeah, thank you for this uh, interesting question. <laughs> Indeed, um, I think uh, the term lymphoproliferative disease uh, has been used in a few entities in the newly updated WHO URTC um, classification from 2018-2019. Now we can't like, like that, from, for example, the whole group uh, lymphoproliferative diseases, uh, including, uh, for example, the lymphomatid papulosis. So those diseases um, have an excellent prognosis, just as uh, the marginal zone uh, B-cell lymphoma of the skin has. So I believe that um, it deserves uh, the term lymphoproliferative disease um, and as such deserves also to be included definitely as an independent entity also in the WHO classification. So I think this is um, what um, will happen in the next 10 years from now. Another qu question or the first question from 
Lisa Mette, can you comment on the presence of clonal versus non-clonal plasma cells in primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphomas? Do you utilize CD123 in the diagnosis? Can you comment on IgM class switch versus non-class switch cases? How important is it to make the distinction? Um, clonal versus non-clonal plasma cells in primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma is, is a major diagnostic criterion. So um, for this, uh, usually we rely on immuno immunocytochemistry and uh, based on in-situ hybridization for the kappa or lambda. Um, chain, uh, if you wish to term that clonality, but you see some restriction in the light chain. And this one is, is a signature, signature um, factor to diagnose uh, marginal tone lymphoma. If you mean probably molecular biology and the um, B cell receptor um, clonality on the level of the heavy chain, most commonly, or the light chains, this is a bit more trickier situation because the sensitivity and the specificity of this technique for marginal tone lymphoma, but also for follicular lymphoma is really low. It is around 50 to 60%. So if you rely on uh, B cell um, clonality on a molecular biology level, solely on the uh, heavy or solely on the light chain, you will miss a lot of uh, clonal proliferations one way is to combine both heavy and light chain clonality, or honestly, uh, in most cases, you don't need it because the immunohistochemistry and the clinical pathological correlation and the kappa lambda expression is so clear and everything matches that uh, this is um, just additional piece of information which is useful to build um, um, our knowledge and redefine criteria later or invent novel techniques but at the moment, it's not um, it's not obligatory to perform it. Um, on the IgM class switch versus non-class switch cases, uh, well, this is um, important also if you if you think um, um, in the context of other uh, marginal tone lymphomas, not cutaneous one that we have not been discussing today. So the whole group of marginal tone lymphomas, as defined in the WHO classification involves uh, tumors in mostly in gastrointestinal, the mouth lymphomas, but also some other tissues. So interestingly, those are most commonly um, IgM positive, so they are non-class switched, and they express this uh, CXCR3. <clears throat> so they have their different entities, they have different uh, immunological features, they have different behavior, and they're just not primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma. The primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma that we see in dermatology usually is uh, IgM class switch. That means the cells have already developed for production of IgG or IgA or IgE. And this is an important um, diagnostic tool to help in case of uncertainty or if you want to um, exclude um, other diagnosis or secondary cutaneous manifestation of other lymphomas, and uh, also helps you not to overlook uh, something because in the more rare group of IgM non-class switched cutaneous lymphoma, we have observed um, more common non-cutaneous manifestation. So it is um, a bit a philosophical question, <laughs> what is first and what comes second? Uh, but I think it's important um, to perform this staining as well. The same is also with the IgG4. Um, so if you never uh, check for IgG4 profiling um, and the ratio to IgG, you will just probably miss some cases um, and it is important to include it in your um, panel for the diagnosis. Okay, have, have you finished, Simonella? Yeah, I think the next question is for you, yeah. Pablo. Yes, um, it's a question from Halid. I, I'm not sure if it's uh, our friend Halid Asad. He mentioned that, uh, as we know, surgery and radiotherapy have very high local control rates. Which therapy would you prefer for your patient as a primary therapy? I think I, I mentioned that uh, 
if the patient comes to, to the op to the office and has a single lesion, if the lesion can be excised, I do directly on the first day of the of the uh, if I have, have high uh, suspicion of uh, lymphoma, I do, I go for surgery. If it's too big to to excise, uh, I prefer to send the patient into into radiotherapy. I don't know what you think, Manuela. Um, yeah, I, I I fully echo you. I also prefer the the radiotherapy just because, but depends on the dosage, right? Because it's very debatable. Shall we use uh, dosage above twenty gray, or shall we go for for less? And um, I have observed that with doses up to fourteen, eighteen grays, we can mostly control excellently primary cutaneous B cell lymphomas. Uh, without um, necessarily higher rate of um, local recurrence, but the recommendations vary very broadly. And and then if we agree that the patient should receive 24 up to 30 grays, then probably I will um, think twice because it's double the doses that I would otherwise um, recommend. So definitely research is also needed here. Uh, there is one, one new... Um, type of radiotherapy. It is called flush radiotherapy. So it's a new way um, to perform radiation uh, by sparing um, the normal tissue in a better way than we can do now. So I think this one will have uh, will have also future um, in our field. For, for now, it has been applied only in one patient with spontaneous uh, uh, T-cell lymphoma doll. Emanuela, flash radiotherapy is with photons or it's electrons? with photons, yeah. Photons. yeah. Mm. So okay. there is a question from Hector Ferrandones. Uh, um, thank you very much, uh, Hector, for um, for the positive feedback first. <laughs> and uh, you ask that in plasma cell rich primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma, it is, indi is it indicated further testing like proteinogram, urine test on bone marrow biopsy to exclude extra med medullary multiple uh, myeloma? So because actually I want to show you something, but let me first go back to the question so that I can address it point by point. So in plasma cell rich, um, well, um, serum electrophoresis or so proteinogram is actually recommended for every uh, primary cutaneous B-cell lymphoma, marginal zone one and follicular one. Um, and um, I perform it always, and I have not yet found a multiple myeloma, honestly, but I have found uh, a very high number um, of, um, of um, not otherwise uh, significant, um, now, now I like the, the term for that. Um, Papu, can you help me? <laughs> Uh, no, no, not now. <laughs> Sorry. Before the multiple myeloma, what is the D9 precursor of the oh, yeah, of the disease? Uh, the, um, uh, um, um, the um, uh, unknown meaning or... Uh, of, of unknown significance, <laughs> yeah, but yes. I, I just like the name of the disease. It is because of the time change, definitely. Um, yeah, so, and, and this is... Um, so if you have um, a changes in the serum electrophoresis, or if you have any other indications, then of course a bone marrow biopsy is indicated to further um, follow up on systemic involvement or concomitant additional uh, second lymphoma or another disease. <laughs> but otherwise, bone marrow biopsy is not mandatory for marginal tone lymphomas. And um, just while preparing the presentation, I actually, um, and I will show you, but I have a slide on that for the marginal uh, zone lymphoma. Let's see if we can go there. That's that one. You mm -hmm. see uh, by the group around Marion Wopser in Würzburg, they recently, it's a 2020 publication, they tried to co correlate the expression of the corresponding uh, heavy or light chain in the tissue, in marginal tone lymphomas, and in the serum. And there may be some correlation, although, of course, we have a very limited number of patients. Um, so um, I think research and further observations uh, are needed here. So now the name of this is um, 
no, sorry. We, we will go There's back a, to that one. <laughs> we have, we have help from the from the chat. Uh, um, uh, monoclonal monoclonal gam gamma gammopathy, of, of course. Of known. That's it. Unknown significance. MDUS. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so several of our friends helped us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so. So the, the next question, I think, is for me uh, re regarding primary cutaneous follicular center lymphoma. Do you have any tips regarding the histological differentiation between diffuse large cell uh, follicular center lymphoma and leg type? Um, usually, they, there is a, a, a mix with a, between different kind of cells, but occasionally there is, this mix is not present. When you find the mix with different large and small cells, uh, is, uh, more frequently you go to follicular. But occasionally it's monomorphic, it's rarely, but it uh, can be follicular. In this case, you need the uh, immunohistochemistry. Uh, in this case, um, um, leg type is usually double positive with BCL2 and BCL6, and usually it's positive also for MOM1 and for FOXP1. So uh, with all this combination of uh, immunohistochemistry, uh, it's better to to consider uh, a leg type and not a follicular center. Mm -hmm. I think we missed one question from Prachite, um, and um, she's interested if inhibition of Borrelia burgdorferi manipulates or affects the immunity of the particular person suffering from primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma while or during the diagnosis. Rajita, thank you for, for this question. If uh, the person is um, positive or if the anamnesis is significant for a recent infection ongoing with Borrelia burgdorferi and you have this, what we usually will call lymphocytoma, um, if the skin, in my experience, they actually can be treated effectively with either doxycycline or another tetracycline systemic antibiotic. But as I said, unfortunately, the data on this are still low, um, and the level of reported efficacy is around 40 to, to 50%. If the immunity is affected, I, I'm afraid there are no data on that. The, the subject of Borrelia burgdorferi infection in B-cell lymphoma was a very debated one, uh, maybe in the last 20 years and a little bit less now, it seems to be endemic phenomenon in some regions, uh, particularly in the south of uh, Germany and Austria, where they seem to have a little bit uh, higher correlation of Borrelia burgdorferi infection and primary cutaneous marginal tone lymphoma. These data have not been um, uh, confirmed in other parts of the world. Um, so, um, it is necessary either to, to reconfirm, um, to perform more um, analysis, um, to consolidate uh, this part. But there are cases, but it's just definitely by far not, not in every marginal tone lymphoma. So it's not necessary to treat standards with antibiotics. But first check for serology, and if positive, then this is a good treatment. There is a question about a uh, watch and wait uh, approach. Um, it's from Matthias Anand. Uh, mm -hmm. When performing a watch and wait approach, uh, how often do you revisit patients? I have to say that I, I almost never, in, in, in follicular center, almost never uh, practice wait, wait, um, wait, wait, watch and wait, sorry. Uh, in marginal zone, I do, but nothing follicular. And in case of marginal zone, what I do is uh, I visit the patient more or less every three to six months, but I train the patient to, to tell them, if you any of those lesions uh, start growing fast, you can come to my office without any previous appointment. So I, I leave the, the door open to the patient. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I, I agree with you. We do the same. Sometimes it, it depends. We adapt, of course, to the patient's wish. But I'm also more comfortable if we have watchful waiting for marginal tone lymphoma and not for follicle center lymphoma. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gwenova and Professor Ortiz for um, leading uh, another um, session on, on cutaneous uh, lymphoma. And of course, uh, thank you audience for your participation, but also engagement in uh, scientific uh, discussions uh, at, the, at the end. And of course, before we go, I have uh, some information. Uh, so first of all, please do not forget to fill in the survey we will send you after this uh, webinar. Uh, it's also very important for credit points um, to, to fill in this um, survey. Um, and of course, uh, please um, register for the next session. It will take place the uh, 16th of uh, November. November. And in meanwhile, I would like to invite you to subscribe to our newsletter, uh, follow us um, on uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And please visit uh, our Eurobloodnets Edu YouTube channel, where we post uh, all of the webinar uh, sessions and uh, many other interesting uh, videos. Thank you very much, and hopefully see you um, all you present next, uh, next time. Um, and 11 uh, 16th of november thank you much and bye bye thank you very much i would like to to thank the audience for being here and for their kind uh, comments on the in the chat thank you very much bye. thank you also from my side it was a pleasure thank Have you a good evening, thank everybody. you very much bye bye bye, bye.